Hi, I'm Christina Bergston with the Animal Law Firm, where we are fighting for the underdog in Colorado, Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey. We hope to be in Texas this year and in all 50 states within the next five to 10 years. So please keep your ears peeled for an animal law firm opening near you. First, before we get started, I would like to say thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to meet big hearted breeders such as yourselves who are doing such a great service to breeding to dogs and to human and animal relations so thank you so much for everything that you do i am so grateful to be here and to get to meet all of you today i would like to talk about contracts of course no attorney talk would be complete without talking about contracts and contracts are the biggest issue that i see litigated in my line of work I've worked with many breeders over the years and I've seen a wide variety of contracts and a wide variety of problems. As many of you know, and maybe some of you have, or maybe all of you have, we have purchase agreements. If you do not have a purchase agreement, <laughs> see me. <laughs> this is first and foremost the most important document that you can have. It protects you, it protects your puppies, it protects your reputation, it protects your line, and it protects the, your client and your customer, of course. The other type of contract that I typically see is a guardianship contract. These are probably the most litigated contract that I encounter. There are a wide array of problems that can happen and a well-written guardianship contract will save you thousands of dollars in the long run, thousands of hours of headaches, tears, agony. <laughs> Having a good and proper and clear breeder guardianship contract is the best preventative that I can prescribe. <laughs> the third and final contract that I typically see in litigation is co-ownership agreements. These can take a wide variety of uh, looks. So we can have co-ownership agreements for breeding. We can have co-ownership agreements for showing, we can have co-ownership agreements for breeding and showing, um, and we can have co-ownership agreements with respect to, I mean, I guess studs, but that would kind of go along with breeding. So, I mean, I just see them in different variations. So um, there's a lot of different things that can go wrong if you do not have a good and proper co-ownership guardian or purchase contract. I would again i would say the most often litigated is the guardianship contract but i will start with the purchase agreement because that is most likely what all of you have again if you do not have a purchase agreement <laughs> please see me <laughs> i can definitely help you um, these are the most simple and straightforward contracts i strongly recommend that you have your company name do not put your personal name have your company name your kennel name your breeder name whatever you operate your business under have that be the name that you put as the owner of the dog the seller of the dog and then of course have the buyer's name now oftentimes most of the contracts usually have a name for one buyer I strongly recommend that you have a name for more than one buyer. A lot of times people will purchase puppies uh, in a relationship and then later separate and then later they want you to come testify in court as to which one of them really owns the dog. A brief scenario is a boyfriend and girlfriend let's say and the boyfriend buys the puppy for the girlfriend for Christmas and it's intended as a gift but he's the one who signs the paperwork because the puppy is a gift and the, he's the one who paid, he's the one who contacted you, and so he signs the contract. Well, later, when they inevitably break up, the girlfriend will want you to come in to testify to your knowledge of this puppy being a gift, or he might even want you to come in to testify that the puppy is a gift. So when you're doing your intake and your interview with your potential buyers, make sure that you i typically recommend that people have an adoption application or a purchase application it, it depends on how in depth you want to get in this process and what your screening process is 
but I would ask a few questions because this kind of protects you. And then I would also put a clause in the contract that indicates that you will not be testifying in the event of a dispute as between any owners or co-owners. Um, this will save you lots of time and headaches later. So again, I would have at least two signature lines for uh, the buyer because you want to make sure that you are putting as much information in the contract as possible. Obviously, the next thing you want to have, most breeders have health guarantees. Um, typically what I see is usually like a hip dysplasia or genetic defect guarantee up to one year. And then I typically see that the purchaser is supposed to take the puppy to a licensed veterinarian within seven to 10 days after purchase in order to verify that the puppy is healthy. And then if not, that the veterinarian needs to make a written statement that the puppy is not healthy, is not fit for sale, um, and that the buyer needs to uh, present that to you and then the, and then in the contract, what I typically see is that the seller or you will provide a refund or a replacement puppy. Um, a lot of the litigation that I see comes from buyers with respect to this particular clause. Colorado does not have what is known as a puppy lemon law. And by lemon law, this is typically language used for cars. So, oh, I bought a used car and it turned out to be a lemon. So they have lemon laws for automobiles. Well, they also, in many states, have lemon laws related to puppies um, or you know, animals bred and sold. Colorado does not have one. New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania all have puppy lemon laws. Puppy lemon laws are actually a breeder's best friend because it limits your liability. So in Colorado, in, in any other state, and check your, your local state, your local legislation to see if you have a puppy lemon law legislation, because then you can incorporate that statute section into your contract, and then you don't have to write out all this detail. Um, but in states that don't have it, like Colorado, it would be advisable that you have this kind of language that the health guarantee, they have to go within seven to 10 days. They have to have a written statement from a veterinarian saying that the puppy is not fit for sale or that the puppy is gravely ill and what the problem is and why and um, what the veterinarian is planning on doing about it. And then the replacement puppy and or the refund is typically where we see this litigation. Um, a lot of buyers will come to me saying that, well, my puppy had parvo and so now I have like a $10,000 bill or the puppy died and now you know I can't be made whole from this. Um, so it's always good to have a liability waiver and an indemnification waiver um, because then you're protecting yourself against any future lawsuits for this sort of issue. And also having a provision in there that just says all sales are final. Um, that will do a lot to help protect you. Uh, the liability waiver should state, and like I said, in most, in the if three out of the four states that I practice in, we have the puppy lemon law, which specifically states this in the law. But if you were in Colorado or another state that doesn't have a puppy lemon law, it is always good to put in your contract that states that any liability is is limited to either the purchase price of the puppy or the uh, the vet bills whichever is lower right so let's say you're selling a puppy for a thousand dollars or maybe <laughs> if you're selling a if you're selling a french bulldog for eighteen thousand dollars perhaps this isn't going to be applicable to you but if you're selling a puppy for five hundred dollars a thousand dollars something like that, then you want to make sure that your liability is limited to either the purchase price or the, the vet bills, whichever is lower. And obviously none of you will have this sort of situation, but if the puppy is gravely ill with parvo or something like that, you, you know, you, you're limiting your liability just to the purchase price versus the $10,000 bill. Um, in the event that you are selling your puppies for much higher price, like some of the French Bulldogs that I've seen, um, or any other designer breed, you are, uh, you're going to want to put a limitation in there, period. D pick a dollar amount, a thousand dollars, or whatever number is agreeable to you. It doesn't, I'm just throwing out numbers at this point. Um, 
but this will help protect you in the long run and make sure that your liability is limited and you're not stuck with a ten thousand dollar vet bill some people will come in you know a year later or nine months later and say well my dog was diagnosed with hip dysplasia so again you want to make sure that any health guarantees that you're giving that whatever guarantee you are giving you have a clause underneath it that says that my liability as the organization is limited to x amount of dollars that way it's very clear and there's no question and you're protected because you also don't want to have a situation where someone goes onto facebook and says i went to this breeder and i bought this puppy and now my puppy has hip dysplasia and it's only nine months old or well, I mean, I guess it would be more like 11 months old or something like that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I've only had this puppy for nine months and it has hip dysplasia, right? So, um, you know, and I mean, that's another clarifying question. Sometimes people will say that, I've seen contracts where it says that the, the guarantee is for 12 months, and a lot of times that gets interpreted as 12 months from the date of purchase, not 12 months from the date of birth. So make sure that you have those provisions in there to further make it clear to a judge or a jury what exactly it is you are guaranteeing. The next contract that I want to talk to you about is guardianship contracts. <laughs> These get litigated like crazy. I had a breeder one time come to me and a lot of times what it is is that you know you you engage in a guardianship contract and a lot of times people will breeders will have a purchase contract and then they have a guardianship addendum and that is fine but i think that that can be very confusing right because then you're making the judge look at the purchase contract plus the guardianship contract and i can't tell you how many times i've been in front of a judge who does not understand that dogs have a different value if they're a pet versus if they're a pet or if they're a, a, a dog purchased for breeding or showing a lot of times judges i had to explain to a judge one time what breeding rights were <laughs> i know that sounds crazy but it's true i i was very shocked because i thought well breeding is a pretty clear word it's not it's not an uncommon word but i had to explain to this judge what breeding rights were and why a dog that is purchased from let's say a pet store or even a a, a competing breeder who sells only pets that why a pet is different from a dog that has breeding rights or breeding capabilities. Um, it was an interesting conversation. So you don't necessarily have to go into that much detail on your contract, but you do want to make sure that in your contract with guardians, you are indicating again that you as the company and the guardian and who it is specifically and um, you also want to make sure that you include in the contract that this is the value of the puppy as a pet versus this is the value of the puppy as a dog with breeding rights. And then it's very clear on the contract and it's spelled out for the judge so that there can be no question that if this dog were to be purchased as a pet, it's only worth, let's say, $1,000 versus $20,000 as a dog with breeding rights. Um, this will save you a lot of headache in the future. And if you're not able, if you live in a state where the animal law firm does not operate, um, this will also help any local counsel uh, try to explain this to the judge and it'll be a quick educational <laughs> lesson for local counsel. That said, uh, there are rules in the United States that allow uh, attorneys who are not licensed in certain states. So let's say you live in Texas and you have a situation like this, uh, as the animal law firm, as a licensed attorney in another state, we can come and help you in your local state via what is called pro hoc vice. Uh, if you talk to local counsel and you find a local attorney in Houston, Texas, let's say, and but they they don't want to litigate this because they don't know how, you can have them call us and we can work it out so that we will be admitted pro hoc vice to help you in a state that we are not currently licensed in. So anyway, back to the contract. So the um, contract basically will want to say, again, the difference in price, but also you want to have very clear and very, very explicit instructions 
for what happens in the event of default. I want to see an entire page at least devoted to default. You want to go into and bullet point every single duty that the guardian is responsible for, every single uh, maintenance or care item that the breeder or that the guardian is responsible for in terms of monetary. And then you want to outline your duties and responsibilities, both financial and physically, uh, with respect to the the dog that is being guarded. I typically only see this in situations with female dogs, not with male dogs. Um, so you know you want to make sure that the the uh, <laughs> that the um, heat cycle is recorded. I would put that in your contract as well. Like have this is the last, I mean, sometimes this won't happen depending on the age of the dog, but if it exists, the last known heat cycle, the anticipated next heat cycle, and I want to see that you're keeping track of this at home in your own house, like keep a spreadsheet for each one of your dogs and each one of the guardian homes and make sure that you're recording that. Make sure that you have regularly scheduled phone calls with your guardian. It doesn't have to be every week or um, probably maybe once a month. And then depending on when the heat cycle happens and your availability to go and pick up the, the mother dog, which is what I would recommend doing, of course. Um, some situations, you know, you have to use your judgment. Do you trust this person to whelp the puppies or do you want to do it? I typically recommend that the breeder does it because sometimes when people see those puppies, they don't want to let them go. And this can cause a lot of drama. I had a breeder one time who had this woman act as a guardian for one mother dog and they had kind of a very very informal agreement and then she acted as another she took on another mother dog and they had no written agreement and i think they had an email that said you know we're going to enforce we're going to go under we're going to operate under the terms of the first contract um not a good idea <laughs> like i said detail is your best friend the more detail you can put in the contract the better um, and so this ended up blowing up and turned into a year and a half of litigation. It did finally settle, but it was, it was a lot. We were able to get the puppies out and adopted to their, uh, to, to my client's customers, but it, it did take some fighting. And of course, naturally this hurt the breeder's reputation because now he had about seven, uh, customers who, you know, were advised of this litigation limbo that their puppies were in because of course the the car, uh, excuse me the guardian took the opportunity to say oh the breeder's suing me and he's a bad guy and all this stuff so um oh i can't release the puppies to you because of because uh so and so is suing me so again <laughs> typically i recommend that if you can whelp the puppies you should if you're not in a position to do that then definitely make sure that you have very clear timelines and instructions and very very de detailed default provisions in your contract um, i would strongly recommend that you have uh, penalty provisions in your contract because if this situation happens to you where you know the the guardian is whelping the puppies and you have buyers lined up and they're coming to your guardian's home to pick up their puppies and i would also not have your guardian handle the money <laughs> so i i understand that sometimes breeding can be a cash business and that is fine however I would strongly recommend that you have some sort of online payment portal system where the buyer is paying you and no money is going through the guardian because then you have another situation where you know this guardian is holding on to a bunch of checks or a bunch of cash and that is never a good situation to be in. So definitely make sure you are doing whatever you can to bypass the guardian when it comes to getting money collected from your buyers. That might seem like obvious, obvious advice, but um, it never hurts to, <laughs> to say it again. Uh, again, you know, default provisions. So going back to that, so every, for every day that your guardian does not complete the sale or does not prov uh, 
comply with terms of the agreement. Like let's say the guardian is supposed to bring the mother dog to you for veterinary checks or she or the guardian is just supposed to take the dog to the vet locally for these veterinary checkups. Um, every day that this guard, yeah, that this guardian does not do that, you should have a penalty provision of like a hundred dollars or maybe even five hundred dollars, and then you can make sure that you are protected in the event of default. Um, I'm just realizing now that my time is up. I thought, oh, <laughs> I could never talk for twenty minutes straight, and then I remembered I'm an attorney. I can basically never shut up. So um, the final contract I did want to talk about was a contract related to co-ownership. I see a lot less litigation with respect to this. That said, if you um, have any questions or concerns about that, feel free to email me. My email is K as in Christina, B as in Bergston at theanimallawfirm.com or check out our website at www.theanimallawfirm.com or give us a call at 1-844-PET-LAWYER. That's 1-844-738-5299. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Take care.